Hey, this is Chris Gore. Join me and a group of very special guests in Anaheim, California at WonderCon. We'll be doing the podcast live. It's Film Threats Mega Movie War 2017 on Sunday, April 2nd at 2.30 p.m. at WonderCon in California. Come see the podcast live. And now, another episode of the podcast. show i am that chris gore sometimes known as chris gore and that chris gore joined as always by anthony ray bench lead film critic for filmthreat.com how you doing anthony doing great chris now, how are you now i said lead film critic for uh, filmthreat.com but you may or may not have a future on the podcast yeah um we did a poll how did that poll go, Chris? Well, see, th- this, the, first of all, let's let's. Uh, there's a couple things we did. One, we we pointed out the fact that the 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 numbers on the podcast are not rising. Yeah, we're not getting more listeners. Actually, we have listeners dropping off. So I actually asked people uh, to reach out and tell us how we might improve the podcast. Well, it was my idea as a joke, and you took it quite literally and ran with it. <laughs> Well, that's true. But uh, I, I actually, we got some really thoughtful letters. Uh, one of the letters uh, from Tim Yeaglin, he said, I just finished episode six of the podcast and uh, I would fall into the I'm too nice to say anything category. I've listened to each episode so far. And if you're looking for some creative criticism, here are my thoughts. Uh, so basically, he says he listens to a lot of podcasts and um, he likes some stuff and he dislikes some stuff. One of the things he points out as a critique, which I completely agree with, is we have to do much better prep. Mm-hmm. We have to prep. I mean, we need to have like screens open on our on our computer so we can like reference things and actually get get some facts right and maybe even some pronunciations. I think yeah, that would we're Im- terrible. That, that would improve the show. But then he does have some positive things to say. He says there are several movie podcasts that I listen to. I gave up on the Slash Film podcast. I actually like the Slash Film uh, dot com uh, website. I have not listened to the podcast. But but he, he goes on to say, he go, go, goes on to say a lot of good things. So so we did. I, I'll tell you this: all the letters we got, we take them very seriously. We got like four or five letters. So if you do want to send uh, an email uh, to us, just email filmthreatgore at gmail.com. And that's because I just haven't set up at filmthreat.com email addresses yet. There's a lot of, th- I have a giant checklist of things that I have to do uh, to, to improve the show. But I want to thank you guys for the letters. Um, we read them all. And, and, and I you do know what? People it. have been supportive too. People and have we been supportive. Should, we should really thank the people that have been people supportive. People said nice things. But look, before, yeah. before I reveal the results of this poll, because this is this is an important poll. Like Anthony, this is your fate is at stake here. Oh God! No, I'm serious. This is a this is um, a serious I, I thing. I know you're like, serious. I mean, and you've been working. We've been working together now for since last year. I mean, you helped with the Kickstarter mm-hmm. when the Kickstarter originally started back in August. Yep. You know, so so you helped me with that. You asked me. You volunteered to to help even on the Film Threat documentary and started working on all of the um, sorting out through our archives. You helped fulfill the Kickstarter rewards. But the one thing you wanted to do... Remember those lights that crashed, Chris? That's remember true. the lights. Yeah. <laughs> Just remember the lights. when. But the one thing you wanted to do was be on this podcast, but now your fate is at stake. My, my fate is in the people's hands. We asked people on Twitter... On the latest Film Threat podcast, we asked, should we keep or dump critic Anthony Ray Bench? And we gave, we gave them two choices, keep Anthony or dump Anthony. We now, we now have the results of the poll. Oh, God, I'm shaking. <laughs> this is, look, I, I feel like we're being very democratic here, right? You know, we're, this is part of the democratic process. We're, we're, giving, we're giving choice to the Film Threat podcast listeners. The people have a voice. Here are the results of the poll. Are you ready to hear them? No, but go ahead. All right. I think that that's, I think that tension is enough. Oh, it didn't get to my favorite part. Okay, wait, okay, here we go. <laughs> and here are the results. Keep Anthony or dump Anthony? The final poll results are 
You ready to hear them? Yes. Okay. It's uh, it's 62% keep Anthony, 38% dump Anthony. Anthony, you are here, still on the show. All right. Suck yes. it, haters. Yes. Suck it, haters. Yeah. So, here, but, you know, I don't know. But in order to really be democratic, I think that what we should do is, um, I think you should speak 38% less. <laughs> Just as a way to... <laughs> No, I, look, it was, I, I think that was, a, whatever. We turned it into a, a fun poll. Um, I, I'm glad the results are keep you. I actually, because I was worried for a second. I thought, wait a second, if we do this poll, what if people really don't like you? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's hard to tell sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. In my personal life as well, Uh huh. I, I just don't know how I come off Oh, stop people. it. You're a very, very positive Eeyore. Aw, thank you. <laughs> Uh, but before 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 we start talking about uh, movies this week, we've got a lot of indie films to talk about. We're actually going to go to a movie and then talk about it after because I think people. One of the comments we got, one of the pieces we're just going to accept the poll. We aren't going to investigate into Russian. We're not, no, yeah, exactly, exactly. How many <laughs> Russians voted in that poll? No, but look, it was that that's a, that's a majority rules. I mean, that's you know, sixty two percent is pretty good. So, well, thank you everybody, and for the people that voted against me, I'm coming for every single one of you. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, we are going to try to improve, and we are going to try to find more of a flow. Yes, and, well, a, a, more of a, more of a flow and an outline to the show. But one of the things yeah. people said that they really liked, and I actually agree with this. I think that like there's too much um, that goes into producing a podcast where you put on your cans, you sit in front of the microphone in a perfectly hermetically sealed environment so it's nice and quiet and so that it sounds perfect and you do your show and there's some podcasts that I think are overproduced. Oh yeah. 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 So we definitely play we've been playing it a little too loosey goosey, but I do like getting out in the field. I like going to film festivals. I like going to conventions, comic conventions like yeah. WonderCon, which we're gonna be at WonderCon Sunday, April second, two thirty PM. Uh come to the panel for our live podcast podcast tape recording what was the best part of school going on field trips exactly exactly yeah. so we're going to be doing that a lot more with the film threat podcast with sort of a, a you know a portable rig that we can take to movie theaters and whatnot because i'm certainly not getting invited i'm not not on a lot of screening lists i will say that <laughs> I, we have to pay for our tickets so uh you know maybe we could, maybe if we could line up the Arclight cinemas as a sponsor they would comp us some some free passes maybe let's hit them up let's so what you're up. saying is we're not vip we're just ips we're not vip yeah exactly we're just ips yeah yeah i, I don't even know if we're IPs. we're just ps Inqu- inconsequential we're people, people. Yeah, yeah inconsequential right <laughs> so so uh yeah we're gonna go see a film talk about some movies but uh before we talk about that stuff i'm friggin' exhausted and kind of hung over i gotta be honest because uh last night i went to uh i went to this game of thrones live concert experience Mm -hmm. and dude it was incredible if you check my instagram on instagram i'm that chris gore yeah um or on twitter i'm that chris gore but like i was posting photos from it and i got there like any concert when i go to a concert it was at the la forum in los angeles um uh, where the Lakers used to play mm-hmm. years ago. And also I've seen several concerts there. I've seen Weezer there. I've seen Nine Inch Nails. Um, and I got, oh, this is fine. I got busted in the parking lot because typical, when you go to something like the LA Forum, drinks are overpriced. A beer is $14, right? That's too much. Cocktails are $14. So I like to bring, I like to bring some roadies. I like to tailgate in the parking lot. Here's what happened at the Nine Inch Nails show years ago. I'm sitting there and I had brought some beer and I'm drinking some beer and just sort of keeping it low key, you know, like, uh, and, and some dudes walked up, these sort of hipster looking dudes. And I'm thinking like, I'm a friendly guy. I offer, someone's cool to me. We're, we're all fans of Nine Inch Nails and I'm offering them a beer, right? Turns out they're undercover cops. Oh no. Yeah. And it was weird because they weren't dressed, obviously they weren't dressed like cops, but they pulled out, he had like uh, a, a necklace that had his badge on it mm. and basically said, look, I can give you a ticket or you can pour that out. So I poured out my beer. At least he was nice about yeah, it. Yeah, he was nice about it. But this Game of Thrones live concert experience. How was, was it? it? It was amazing. It was amazing. I am so I mean, jealous of it you. It was, uh, I mean, look, here's, it, you, they played like some of the major themes live, of, of course, including the title track for the show, which, I mean, that show is fantastic. I don't know if you're... Are you a fan? I'm a big fan of Game of Thrones. Okay, cool. So I've read the books. I've watched every single episode many times. New season starts, I believe it's a week before Comic-Con. It's July 17th. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So did that they is, show any footage from the new season? Not at all. No but teasers? they did. Oh. What's weird is, is I feel bad because if you had been, if you attended this concert and you are not caught up on Game of Thrones, there were spoilers on these giant screens. So they had like a, this whole choir. They had an orchestra. They had these giant screens where you know they were showing scenes from Game of Thrones from all the various seasons and I've just forgotten how many resonant themes there are for different characters and different you know battles like the Battle of the Bastards mm-hmm. I, it's, I love seeing Ramsey's get it like he <laughs> totally deserves it oh, but yeah. uh, what a great event it was uh, so that was uh, just what I recorded off my iPhone uh, from the show and uh, it was amazing so so yes, I know it's not technically film related or indie film related, but you know, you know what? the way they make that show is better than some. some yeah, some some episodes, especially the last two episodes of last season, they're works of art. They're they're I mean like well yeah the budget is like a, a big budget movie, but it's uh, incredible. And so um, if I know they're doing this big tour, so if you have the opportunity to see it, highly recommend it. Just make sure you bring extra money. For for drinks that you're gonna have to pay for because these th- did I mean, they have the Game of Thrones beers? They did. What's a weird? They didn't have the Game of Thrones Aww. beers. They just had Stella, Bud Light. You know your typical mm. stadium choices. Um, but I do have uh, a bottle of that uh, Game of Thrones uh, Pale Ale or whatever it was. Oh, they have a ton of different uh, ones. D- they're different ones. Yeah, yeah. I've even got some Star Trek beer actually. Vulcan Ale. I bought last year for the um, the fiftieth anniversary of Star Trek. Mm. I bought a, a, a case of Vulcan Ale from my like, buddy John Giovanazzi. In canon, isn't that stuff supposed to like kill humans? What? What Vulcan Ale? Yeah, I think it's supposed to be super powerful, right? Oh, I actually don't know that. That's oh. something that the internet would know. I don't know. I'm not but- a big Trekkie fan. Oh, <laughs> is Trekkie the preferred? Well, see, you know, it's so funny. I asked that actually, like, what is the term for Game of Thrones fans? Are they thronies? Because mm-hmm. obviously we know, like, like I've heard Star Wars fans referred to as Starwoids. I've never heard You've that. You've never heard that term? There's a movie yeah. called Starwoids, a documentary. Huh. It was directed by a buddy of mine, Dennis Prizuera. Mm. So he, he, uh, he did that documentary. I Star thought his fans were above stupid titles I mean, like that. I, I don't think we really need like, what's, yeah. what are Marvel fans? Marvelies? Marvelites. I mean, Marvelites. I mean, titles are dumb. Yeah, Whatever. You know, look, I'm, I'm a fan of a lot of stuff. So, um, I love, I love Star Trek and Game of Thrones and, and all this, st- all this nerdy stuff and independent films like, Let's actually start talking about this movies for this week. Sure. So last episode, we got to interview writer, director, and actress star Alice Lowe. Yeah, she was fantastic. From the film Prevenge. And I don't know that we we talked to her, but we didn't really get as much of a chance as I would have liked to discuss the film. And you described it as like American Psycho meets the British office, which I think is a great description of the movie. I, I was really proud of that description. It felt like just a dry British comedy mixed with this wonderful, very gruesome, very violent and vicious slasher movie. And it was amazing. It was so good. Alice Lowe was so charming and so, so good in it. And it was amazing that she directed the film while she was, what, seven months pregnant? Yeah, Correct. yeah. She was pregnant when she made it, I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, because we, we talked, we discussed it with her. Yes, yes. But what, what I like about, I think it was very original. We've seen a lot of different takes on the slasher genre, mm-hmm. you know, um, with, and, and, and I think that that genre is kind of tired. Yeah. You know, um, it, just in terms of your traditional, I mean, I love the original Halloween. I think yeah. that that was the movie that kind of cemented I mean, it's sort of the gold standard for slasher horror, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the original John Carpenter Halloween. Yeah. Um, but but this one this one definitely is a completely different take. I like also the voice of the baby. I hated that. The, you hate it? I, I loved was, it. That I know was you my critiqued criticism. It. I, know, I know you critiqued it in your review on filmthreat.com, mm-hmm. but I really felt that that was a great device because it wasn't... I know it was not a child's voice. It was clearly yeah. some... Uh, it had been modulated, uh, someone else's voice modulated to sound as if it was a child. But I, I, it I didn't it totally sound modulated to it was, me. It sounded weird. It was yeah. weird. It wasn't. It sounded like a grown woman trying to sound like a child, I, kind of putting on like a. I thought it was haunting. Mommy. 
No, I yeah. thought it was haunting and creepy I, and, and effed up. It, and it was the it. only thing that took me out of the movie, really? to be honest. Yeah. Well, what I also loved about it was the way she portrayed her various suitors. So here she is. She's a pregnant woman and she's, it's, it's, it, I mean, look, guys in general are just creepy. Yeah. Right. So these were creepy guys that were trying to get it on with a pregnant woman or come yeah. on to her in inappropriate ways. Well, and, it, it's interesting because you have, one of the the victims as kind of fetishizing her, kind right. of really into the fact that she's pregnant. And you have another character, as soon as he finds out that she's pregnant, he's kind of turned off by it. But also he's so horny that he still wants to get it on. But <laughs> it's it's funny because everybody treats her a different way. Almost as if her pregnancy is kind of this disgusting disease you don't want to catch it. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, what I like about it is that she having made it while she was pregnant. I mean, it, there was something about it that it, it just rang very authentic. Mm-hmm. You know, it was very authentically, um, the emotional roller coaster that is, um, a woman in a state of pregnancy. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, look, I, I have kids, so I have been through that. And, uh, you got to, you got to be, look, she's the one that's giving birth to the baby. You got to be very understanding. Mm-hmm. So, um, and yeah, that's the, the guy's role is just to do whatever it, she says in that state, uh, to, to make her feel comfortable because she's the one that's suffering and, and going through, uh, at least the pain of childbirth. Yeah. And I'm sure there's some rewarding aspects to it too, but I will never know that as a, as a guy, I think so coming from her and in that state, I mean, that's what made it feel so real. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sounds, sounds like from when we talked, she, she made it very quickly. It was very quickly produced. She, you know, pitched it and boom, they made it while she was pregnant. Yeah. They gave her two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So I like when films are made under those sort of stressful circumstances. And a lot of times when you hear about the behind the scenes production and making uh, uh, of films. It's not always the ones where we got along great and it was such a fun experience and the movie just turns out, Neh. it's the ones that made under, you know, really stressful circumstances that can turn out fantastic. And I think Prevenge highly recommend it. In fact, I really want to see it again, actually. Yeah, me too. So it's, and it's well worth it. Speaking of Game of Thrones, we had two actresses from Game of Thrones. Two actresses Prevenge. from Game of Thrones. Uh, Jim Whalen and Kate Dickey. Right. And uh, Gemma plays, uh, she plays Theon Greyjoy's sister. Yes. There's that great scene where they first meet up at the, at the, at the harbor. Great scene? You mean creepy scene? Creepy. Well, it's creepy when he you find He heals up his sister. He heals up his sister. He's like t- trying to come on to her and then real, realizes it's his sister. Oh, so she was great at it. She was yeah. fantastic. So yeah, highly recommend Prevenge. I just wanted to talk about it more because I feel like we sort of cut right to, we saw the movie, then we just we were waiting in line to talk to Alice, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah Alice. Yeah, we just yeah. didn't 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 get really as much a chance to talk about the film as I would have liked. So I wanted to talk about that. But we've got some other films to talk about here. Um, you 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 uh, took one for the team. <laughs> you took one for the team, and you went and saw Power Rangers. I, I like how you put that. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes, I did see Power Rangers. Yeah, I uh, did. I didn't see it, and can I just say I have never been a Power Rangers fan. It just it just sort of missed. I'm sure if I saw it when I was a kid, mm-hmm. I, I would like it. Yeah. But it kind of missed, I, I just missed it. You know, yeah. when Power Rangers became popular, I was already a grown up. So yeah. um, I, I don't, there's no sense of nostalgia for me about Power Rangers. I remember that it was on the TV. <laughs> so, so what, so you grew up with Power Rangers though. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan on two different levels. I remember what it was like when it came out when I was a kid. I loved it. It was karate. It was robots fighting monsters. It was awesome. Watching it as an adult, it's silly. It's you know bad. It's it's terrible. The yeah, writing that, dialogue that is awful. Of, but that, you you love it. You love it. Well, that kind of stuff can be. That's what I'm saying. It's mm-hmm. charming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, there's it's very something charming. that when when it's when it's imprinted upon you as a kid, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's why I still love the original '66 Batman television series with Adam West. Exactly. Or a lot of the bad things I saw when I was younger, mm-hmm. like Disney's The Black Hole. <laughs> you know, uh, or Krull. 
the mm-hmm. movie Krull. Oh, I mean, gosh, I, Krull. I, I could I could list off so many television shows and movies. Saw them when I was a kid and just have an affection for them. The original Toho Godzilla films. Yeah, yeah. Huge affection for those in spite of their flaws, right? Like, Yeah, I mean, back then, that was a weekly Toho Godzilla showdown for me. It yeah, was, yeah, it was exactly. giant robots fighting monsters. Right. They would do a week. marathon. They yeah. would do a marathon of those. So, so yeah. So I, I'm, I, I look, I respect anyone. Like I'm not going to sit there and insult someone for loving power Rangers because mm-hmm. I understand the con, the reason you like it is because you saw it as a kid. Yeah. You know, it's the reason that we all gravitate towards comfort food. Why do I still lock, like chicken pot pies? Cause I used to eat chicken pot pies when I was a kid. Love the chicken pot pie. So, so you went and saw the movie. I did. I, I would have gone with you because we had originally planned we were going to go see it together, but I'm glad you saw it and I didn't have to. What, what are your thoughts? You know what? It was, a, it was a poor remake of The Breakfast Club with superhero uh, tropes thrown in for good measure. It wasn't very good. Explain to me what you mean by not very good. Just the... Was it's it the exactly. characters and the special effects look yeah. one thing that actually kind of attracted me to see it because I did actually see the uh-huh. trailer in the theater yeah uh, the special effects look kind of cool it's like alright well we haven't seen that the like, special effects were great in the weirdest places the robots the, the zords the fight scenes were all really well done and really great CG but then you would have these weird scenes where like they would jump off stuff and really? it was just really poorly rendered. Like, they couldn't render the humans doing stuff. See, I suspected that it might be too digital. Yeah. This is the thing. See, I would I would like to see more of this used in indie films. I mean, some of these, you know, off-the-shelf effects are pretty inexpensive. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd love to see some indie movies utilize just a, 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 some, some minor digital effects. Yeah, there's you know? a scene where... One of the characters jumps off a cliff and dives into water. Right. And it gets so fake looking. It looks like they just cut to a video game character jumping into water. Do you think that you are the intended audience for this movie? Because oh, absolutely. Absolutely not. This did not have a lot of well, references what is the, because, and throwbacks I mean, a- to the original. This was a movie made for kids. If I saw this movie as a kid, and I'm going to take my nephew to see it because he, he wants to see it, this would make me a Power Ranger fan. Okay. As okay. An, a fan of the original, as a, an adult, it, it doesn't have what I want in it. Can I, can I just point out one of the criticisms that came up? in the letters that we had received. Why the fuck are we talking about the Power Rangers movie on the Film Threat <laughs> podcast? What the fuck are we doing, man? Come on. All right, but I think your nephew is the right d- demographic, right? Well, how old is he? Like? Absolutely. He's, yeah. uh, oh gosh, I'm going to get in trouble from my mom who listens to the podcast. You don't, you don't know what the <laughs> age of your nephew is? He's seven or eight. He's seven or eight. Seven well, I'm sure eight. when it's his birthday, you'll sorry, find out Mason. how old the nephew that you're related yeah. to is. So, but uh, look... I, whatever. I feel like it's a popcorn movie for kids. It's not for me. And it's probably not for much longer discussion on this podcast. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, I, I do have some things to say because another criticism is I don't explain why I don't like the movie or why I like the movie. Uh, see, see how much yeah. we're reacting yeah. to all these letters? We, we do got like take four, these criticisms. We got like four or five letters. We, we and, take the criticism seriously. Well, I will say that. How about, how about this? Let's find out how many people actually listen to the podcast. So if okay. you send a self-addressed stamped envelope to the film threat office which is really just a mailbox. Mm-hmm. Uh, self-addressed stamped envelope. You know what that is? You mail someone an envelope with a stamp on it. I'll mail you some stickers. That works. I'll mail you some stickers and some other, I'll mail you some really, something really cool for free that will fit into an envelope. I like so that. the address for the film thread is, well, you can go to filmthread.com and it's under the info or you can, uh, the, the address is, you know, film thread, 5042 Wilshire Boulevard, that's W-I-L-S-H-I-R-E Boulevard, PMB 1500, Los Angeles, California, 90036. Mail me a self-addressed stamped envelope. I'll send you some stickers and something free in the mail that is undisclosed at this moment. But let's 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 move on from so Power Rangers is a not recommended. I didn't get What's to tell this? you why I don't recommend it. All right, let's hear why, <laughs> but I really want to not talk about this movie. The movie didn't know what it wanted. It didn't know if it wanted to grab the fans of the old ones and and kind of play the nostalgia factor. And it didn't know if it wanted to completely 
ignore the past and do something different with it. It was this hodgepodge of old and new, and it just didn't work. Brian Cranston, who I love, just came off as an asshole playing the role of Zordon, the mentor of the team. I did like the kids playing the New Rangers. They had great chemistry. They are all relatively unknown actors. I thought that they did great. None of them were super cheesy. Maybe they should have been cheesy because that was the original show's shtick. The effects were great. The ending was cool. It was a giant monster battle. (sighs) Ultimately, the movie's not for me. I wouldn't recommend it, but kids are going to love it. It's going to inspire a whole new generation of Power Ranger fans. Can we can we just read let's your review? Let's go. Yeah. Can you just read your review on filmthreat.com? Yeah, let's move on. Let's move on and and if you want to read Anthony Ray Bench's exhaustive review of the Power Rangers movie. I'm just trying to give the people what they want. <laughs> it'll it'll be on Film Threat. It'll be on filmthreat.com. So, uh l- let's let's move on. There were there were a couple other movies that you wanted to discuss on the show before we make our way to the movie theater. We don't even know what, you know what, we're going to see a movie. I don't even know what movie we're going to see. We're going to go see a movie at the Arclight because it's it's uh, three blocks from my house. I thought we were seeing Life. Yeah, okay, well, we might see Life, but I'll tell you this, if there's a better movie there, we're going to pick a better movie. Okay. So, uh, but but we will, we're, we're going to talk about some film when when we go to the Arclight, but but what, what, what else do you want to talk about? Well, I found out recently that they are making a sequel to Super Troopers. And what's it called? Super Troopers 2. So, okay, so here's, here's this begs the question, and yeah. we started talking about this before, before we pressed record. Mm-hmm. Sequels that come out far long after the original. I yeah. feel like when there's too long of a distance, and there's a movie that's coming out later this year, right? Blade Runner 2049. Right? Is mm-hmm. it Blade Runner twenty forty nine? Yeah. For accuracy's sake, let's try to be accurate. Yep. Um, the sequel to Blade Runner is coming out with Ryan Gosling of all people, and, and Harrison Ford, and it's it's coming out in fall of two thousand seventeen, fall this year. Did they wait too long? I mean, if they're going to make a sequel to Blade Runner, they should have made it a couple years after the fact. I feel like, for example, Star Wars: The Force Awakens making that sequel. So much, I mean, not only they waited so long, here's what bothers me about Star Wars Episode Seven mm-hmm. um, being, they waited too long to make it. Yeah. They waited too long to make it to the point where Carrie Fisher will not be, I mean, passed away. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the force is with her, always. Always. And, um, you know, they waited so long that, you know, she passed away before they could complete, they haven't even started shooting Episode Nine of Star Wars. And the thing that bothers me about this The way that they approach... This is the thing that bugs me about Star Wars Episode Seven: The three will never be reunited. Yeah. Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia will never be reunited on camera. I feel like they waited... They probably waited 10 years too long. That's all we wanted. All we wanted was those three characters to be reunited. I know that, like, you know, they talked about having Luke, you know, appear in the third act of... Force Awakens, and then they said it kind of derailed the movie. I, I the, he, he really, he really should have been there. Yeah. He should have been there, and there should have been uh, my my friend Charles De Lazarico, who's been on an episode of the Film Threat podcast, and will actually be on the panel at WonderCon in Anaheim. Uh, Charlie will be there. Pointed out that it would have been great if if Han Solo didn't die. This is what Charlie said: Han Solo didn't die. He was mortally wounded. Right? Didn't die. Luke Skywalker comes in that moment where the lightsaber's quivering and it goes to Ray's hand. It should have gone into Luke's hand. Or what should have happened is a green lightsaber ignites in the fog. And out from the shadows comes Luke to put an end to this fight between Ray and Kylo Ren, right? He's just there to end the fight. Han Solo's on the ground mortally wounded, you know, dying. And Luke, you know, grabs him. How we doing, kid? Same as always. You know, you can imagine the Harrison Ford's voice. Same as always, kid. And Charlie came up with that? Yeah, Charlie came up with that. Yeah, he's, why he's isn't got, he writing this? I know. What's movies. so funny is that Charlie, I mean, look, he, he works in the industry. He's very polite. But boy, he would give, I would pay him to give script notes. 
He's so good. He will. He's he will a very appear, intelligent guy. Yeah, he will appear on future episodes of uh, Film Threat, and then also and our the, panel. The and our panel and the spinoff podcast, Blockbuster Busters. You want me which, to play the theme which, again? No, don't play the okay. theme again. It's uh, it's a funny theme, but we, look, it's a separate. Once we launch that podcast, it will absolve us of having to discuss the major releases. I feel like we just shouldn't discuss them on the film threat podcast. The film threat podcast will be more interviews with filmmakers and more talk of indie film blockbuster busters will be about shitty power Rangers movies that are looking to reboot a franchise. So, but Charlie came up with that, which I think was a, would be a great idea is that, you know, Han Solo was even like Harrison Ford was deprived of a death scene. He just falls. Yeah. He fall well. I mean, yes, he's stabbed with a lightsaber, but he just falls and he's not able to have a death scene where you get to act. And I feel like that was really mishandled. Um, oh, I, I agree. That entire movie was mishandled. Well, there's, there's a lot me. of things. Let's not let's not actually let's not derail into that. Yeah. But, but I have a question for is, you though. Is is the, the thing I do want to talk about is sequel? Mm-hmm. Do you think they waited too long to make Super Troopers two? I mean, could the original was made. Oh my God! Like what? The, when was the original made? Two thousand one. Two thousand one. So okay, six, uh, sixteen years later. Yeah, yeah, sixteen years later. Has there been like a, a comedy that has come, like a sequel to a comedy that has come, uh, you know, far after the original that has been funny? I can't think of one off the top of my head. Can you? Well, no, but can you? What what, what examples would you cite of ones that were unfunny? Uh, Dumb and Dumber 2. Oh, well, yes. 20 years true. after the original. Yeah, that's true. Uh, a lot of people hated Anchorman 2. I didn't oh, hate God. it. I hated Anchorman really? 2. Really? I hated Anchorman 2. I didn't it hate was, it. It just wasn't as good I, as the original. But I, but I don't know that it has uh, as much to do with that movie as Will Ferrell's character just seems so out of place. Yeah. Like, it feels like that, like, I am this sort of unaware jerk. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like he just plays an unaware jerk all the time. Yeah. And that, that shtick is, has just gotten old and that's what all Anchorman was. That's a lot of SNL actors though. You think so? Oh yeah. Mike Myers. Right. Uh, Adam Sandler. Right. Are you kidding me? Yeah. He has two different characters. He has the, the idiot with the weird accent and he has the tough guy that, turns around in the end and has a heart of gold. Those are the two characters that Adam Sandler does. You have Andy Samberg falling in that down that same route too. Like is it just a weird SNL quirk? It's possible. It's mm. possible. Zoolander 2 is another one. Oh, Zoolander 2. First of all, I didn't even see it, but the reviews for it mm-hmm. were just colossally bad. Yeah, they waited too long. Although didn't that movie, the original Zoolander opened the weekend after 9/11, right? I believe it was the the uh, no it was no look that up, sure. Um, and yeah, so that was sort of a victim of you know, of of I mean, remember the state of the world at that point? Everyone was yeah, was, everybody just, was was down. Yeah, precisely. So, in any case, uh, I, I guess I, I I feel like what is the right window? If you're going to make a sequel to a movie. When should you make the sequel? Because I feel like beyond a certain point, it's not a sequel, it's a reboot, mm-hmm. right? You're really rebooting it. It's not, you know, you can't do... I mean, right now, they, they, they couldn't do a, a, a Star Trek movie with the original cast. No. Yeah. I would say within three years. Within three years? Yeah. Yeah. That I think seems reasonable. three years, is, the movie is still fresh in people's minds. Right. And I think you kind of are still excited. The cast is still you know, relatively looking the same. Well, I mean, think about it. Think about it. The the force awakens is not a sequel to return of the Jedi. If Mm. it was a sequel to return of the Jedi, it would have been about Han, Luke and Leia. It really is a reboot that has to deal with legacy characters from before. Mm. So there, I mean, that's a whole complication. And in addition, you had sort of the scars of the star Wars prequels. So the remnants uh, of that, which is more like the scarring of the audience that had to <laughs> suffer through those. So, uh, yeah. But I, you know what's so funny though? What's so funny? I got in this. Dis- I actually got in this discussion with uh, Char- Charlie. Um, we we're we we're chatting on Facebook and talking about um, how the prequels might have actually just predicted all the sort of chaos that's happening now in our government. 
when you because they and and, and and actually I'm actually in a documentary called The Prequel Strike Back, mm-hmm. which is uh, a documentary um, made by an Austin filmmaker who Austin based filmmaker. Has that released yet? It, yeah, I it saw came the trailer. Out, it came out on digital platforms and DVD. Okay, but what's interesting about it is that it takes the premise because the 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 guy who made it was a kid when he saw uh, the Star Wars prequels, mm-hmm. and it wasn't until he grew up and was north of fourteen that he started reading the internet about how everyone hated the Star Wars prequels. Like, wait a sec, I love these movies. So it's a really interesting look at um, uh, you know. In fact, I think he put the first five or 10 minutes of the prequel strike back on YouTube, which I recommend that you see, but I, that's what I saw. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in any case, um, he, he wants to explore like the sort of generational divide and sort of redeem the prequels. And one of the things that I brought up in, in it, if you watch it, I am interviewed in this documentary. Um, and one of the things I brought up is that I think that George Lucas might have saved the world by actually making a newer generation politically aware mm-hmm. because there there is this thread throughout the prequels of a takeover of a government, a democratic republic, yeah. right? That's taken that's turned into a dictatorship and how that slowly occurs. You know, mm-hmm. like <laughs> I'm not saying this is happening now. Mm-hmm. Fingers crossed. But uh, there's a, a, a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that I find alarming in what's in our government right now. Well, even and going- is there a Darth Sidious involved? <laughs> is there a Darth Maul? Is there a General Grievous out there that is uh, uh, pulling the strings from behind the curtain? We may never know. Even going, we may never know. Even going back a few years ago. Um, the whole concept of going to war under false pretenses is a big thing in the Star Wars prequels. Right, right. And a lot of people correlated that with war for oil and, and everything. The prequels are a lot deeper than people give them credit for. They are. You should just drop your mic right now. And, and I don't mean because that was a smart thing to say. I mean because I don't want you to talk anymore about that. Oh. <laughs> I mean drop your mic because... That, that's uh, okay. Go ahead, get, sell it to me. Now, I, I pointed out that he might have because he wove this. And George Lucas famously he he watches, you know, he watches the shows, he watches the news, yeah, and keeps up with politics. So, so um, and 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 truthfully, um, I think George Lucas is someone to be admired. He doesn't make it all about him. When you look at the behind the scenes of the makings of the Star Wars films, he he celebrates Ben, we wouldn't know names like Ben Burt, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, or John Dykstra. Yeah. Although there's a rift between John Dykstra and, and George Lucas or people like John Knoll, right? Who have been instrumental in the making of the movie, making of the films, um, the Star Wars films, and, and he built them up. He's also very philanthropic, uh, works with a lot of charities, a lot with education. Um, I mean, you know, setting the movies aside, George Lucas is, I believe, out there doing doing good, and uh, using the, the the money that he's amassed for good things. Yeah. Just like just like Bill Gates, so he should be uh, applauded for that. Um, and and I do think that by weaving this into a movie for children, maybe that was kind of the point. I'm going to make the star, and I don't really necessarily believe that the Star Wars prequels are for kids. Kids, mm-hmm. there's stuff in there for kids, but there was stuff in there. Stuff in the original Star Wars films for kids. I always thought the robots were the comic relief. Yeah. You know, C-3PO and R2-D2, they were the Laurel and Hardy. They're there to make you laugh, right? And and to entertain, right? So um, I think the prequels just had sort of cutesy stuff mixed with arms being chopped off. And then weird politics about taxation. But... But I, I think looking looking at it, looking at them now and then seeing like what's happening politically in our world, maybe they are worth taking a second look at. Let's do that on Blockbuster Busters, not the Films Rep podcast. Sure. Cool. All right. Uh, you know what? I want to talk about a DVD. Okay. So it's time for DVD Tuesday. Okay, 
Okay, uh, this is going to be a quick edition of DV Dues Day because I really only only have one film I want to talk about, which was which I was ecstatic when this DVD showed up at the Film Threat office. If any, if anyone's listening that wants to send a, is it Yoga Hosers? It's not Yoga oh. Hosers. It's not Yoga Hosers. Um, it is a movie that um, I saw countless times uh, when I was a kid. It's a classic, I believe, that a lot of people don't know. And um, I just I just have to rave about it. It's a film that I grew up watching called Psychomania. And it's a British film about zombie bikers. Okay? I'm sold. It's, well, it's about these this group of, of bikers that um, uh, the one lead gang member, his name is Tom, discovers the secret to life and death. That if you commit suicide... If you kill yourself and you believe that you're going to come back, you will be resurrected and you will become immortal. Hmm. And he kills himself in a horrible accident, believing that he will cross over to the other side. And he is resurrected at his funeral. And then he convinces all the other members of this gang, you know, and they're doing all sorts of hijinks and stuff, nothing too intense. Um, but all the members of the gang kill themselves and then they're all completely immortal. Hmm. So now they can't be stopped and they go off on some killing spree. So now I don't mean they're zombies in the sense that they're like, you know, they've got uh, gray flesh and they're all ghoulish looking. They're just, you know, unkillable. Yeah. So then they go on a killing spree. It's funny. It's got a, a, a sort of weird 60s soundtrack. Which is which is pretty cool, and uh, the DVD which came from this company uh, Arrow, which uh, it's, it's, it's it's a it's a it's on Blu-ray, and it's also this film I sh- it, I should note it's also known uh, it's it's under different names it's known as the Death Wheelers, so uh, but this this movie was directed by a uh, Hammer veteran Don Sharp, who did movies like The Kiss of the Vampire and uh, Devil Shop, uh, uh, the, 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 wait. The Devil Ship Pirates. What am I saying? Devil Shop. Devil Ship Pirates. Um, and, it, and it's highly entertaining. The Blu-ray is packed with special features. And it's the last appearance of the actor. There's no stars in it, really, except for George Sanders. Hmm. And um, George Sanders, uh, famously, he did this kind of schlocky horror movie, thought his career was over, committed suicide. It was his last film. He committed suicide on April 25th, 1972, uh, swallowing pills in a hotel room in Spain. So, um, but George Sanders is, I mean, he's, he's awesome in the movie. He's sort of the heavy, right? Um, well, not the, not the heavy in the sense, heavy in the sense that he's a recognizable actor yeah. that makes you believe the concept. All about Eve. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, highly recommend getting Psychomania on Blu-ray. And next time I have, I, I, I just picked up, this is a move, this is, I had to buy this, right? So, so Psychomania is a buy. You, you've got to see it. And it's also a movie that I look at this, it's so good. And I talked to a buddy of mine who's a screenwriter, like they really remake the wrong movies. I feel like Psychomania is ripe for a remake or a reboot because conceptually speaking, it's so cool. It's these teenagers. But see, it's also one of those things. It's like, we're going to make a movie about teenagers killing themselves and coming back to life. <laughs> And because teen suicide is such a, I mean, that's such a heavy topic. The last thing you want to do is make a movie that encourages kids to kill themselves. And that's, that's what this movie deals with. So, um, I think it's fantastic. Highly recommended. It's a buy. Cool. And then, and then, um, another, well, it's not a movie, but because guardians of the galaxy two is, uh, uh, going to come out, um, in God, no, we're just, that's coming out in shortly. What? Like four weeks or so. Four or five weeks. So, so yeah. So I picked up. Uh, it's gonna sound weird. I grew up with these movies. Um, it's a four movie collection of Kurt Russell films made by Disney. Okay. Yeah, a four four movie collection. The computer who wore the computer wore tennis shoes. The horse in the gray flannel suit. The strongest man in the world, and now you see him, now you don't. They're cheesy teen movies made by Disney in in the seventies, and and 
I haven't watched him yet, but I just got this uh, four movie collection and I'll be talking about these on a future episode. I just, the one movie that, that of these that I remember really loving as a kid was the strongest man in the world, Mm. because what happens is he eats a box of cereal that has this vitamin in it that makes him super strong. Hmm. And, uh, I don't know. I just remember the commercial really affected me as a kid because they played it relentlessly on television. So, so the only go. one I've seen is the computer wore tennis shoes. Right. Yeah. They played it on Disney afternoon a lot when I was a kid. Yeah. And I'm and sure I think they did like a Disney channel remake. I'm going to, I'm going to predict my review is going to be, they're not as good as I remember them, <laughs> but that's it for this edition of DVD Day. Day. All right, I think uh, I think I think we've gone through all the films for this week. It's time for Anthony and I to head up to the theater. We're going to walk on over to the ArcLight, and we're going to see Life or something better. Nah, we'll see Life. We're going right. to see Life, and we're going to talk about it right after this. Okay, so we just got out of a screening of Life. A- Anthony, what what'd you think? Uh, well, first of all, we should tell the story, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's <laughs> Aliens, or Alien, if Ridley Scott was a Sony director and a hack. Yeah, it, it, I mean, look, first of all, a good cast. Great cast. Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, Ryan Reynolds, uh, an interesting sort of evolving alien that's sort of a... You thought it, the alien was interesting? I thought it was... You know what it, you know what it is? Here's what it is. It's, it's a freaking hentai monster. <laughs> it's, it's, it's 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 I mean it was very it's tentacled and inspired by something you you would see in an hentai animation from Japan. It starts out looking like a used condom. Uh well that's true. It does look a little condomish. And then it evolves into like a manta ray. Yeah, if you've seen the trailer from, you know, if you've seen the trailer for life, you pretty much seen most of the movie except for the semi twist of an ending. And we're not going to discuss the ending no but it but it is sort of a semi twist i thought the ending was kind of clever yeah yeah i I talk about the the very very end there is no post credit scene just so you know we checked uh what was it be moved yeah yeah oh yeah yeah yeah, it was sony has a tagline apparently they have a weird tagline so it's like the 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 sony logo comes up then it says be moved which i guess is their tagline or motto for the company i don't know it made us giggle there's a weird sameness about movies that are produced by sony like in terms of the way that the sound is mixed the way that the music is used um there's just a weird sameness like I don't know. It's not like they have mandates, but I feel like when I see a Sony movie, it's like, oh, so they're going to have music from certain artists. They're going to like, things will be used a certain way. The sound mix will be weird. There'll be lots of overused digital effects. And uh, Sony didn't disappoint in this. It, it pretty much, you know, checked all the boxes of things that they do in, in all their films. Yeah, I think Sony has the worst digital effects out of any of the studio. Uh, the I, big I, studios. I hate to agree with you, but yes. So, so yeah. I mean, this is the, uh, again, this is Why alien. Do you hate to agree with me. I don't hate to agree with you, jerk. <laughs> well, I, I mean, look, oh. this is alien on the International Space Station. Yep. So it's in the near distant future, not too long from now, where uh, a cargo of soil samples from Mars makes it back to this. International Space Station, and it's studied, and of course comes to life and goes on a killing spree. That's all you need to know. That's pretty much, I mean, that's the movie in a nutshell, right? So, um, and and I guess there could have been some likable characters. I kind of thought at the beginning they rushed right into the creature, and we really didn't get a lot on each character. And then you kind of did. You sort of got a little bit of a ca- little bit of character development that I thought was pretty weak, actually. Yeah, I didn't know anything about the characters except for the guy who had a was a daughter or son. Uh, yes, his daughter yeah. was May M E I. Yeah. So he had yeah, a baby. He, he saw his daughter born on an iPad, and then, and then uh, it was the Asian gentleman yep. in the film, and uh, his saw his daughter born, and then Jake Gyllenhaal played a soldier that was kind of disillusioned and wanted to effectively. Stay in, yeah, yeah, I mean. He's a guy that had spent the longest time in outer space. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, you dropped your keys. Oh, I should I should mention that we're actually uh, outside the uh, we're actually outside the. <laughs> Glad you got your keys. Okay, great, cool. Um, 
we're, we're actually outside the Arclight Cinemas in, in Pasadena recording this little tag to the end of our podcast. So if you hear some weird noises, it's because, uh, it's because we're outside right now and, and a woman walked away, nearly lost her keys. I saved her. Riveting podcast material. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Hero gore. Yeah, well, so so back to the movie. Um, <laughs> you know, I, here's the thing. I love movies set in outer space. I just love, and I like science fiction. I like horror. I like 2001, you're going to think I'm a crazy person. I watch that movie at least once a week. Only because I know it by heart. I throw it on and I'll, I'll have it playing in the background while I'm doing something repetitive, mm -hmm. usually on the computer. And I love that film. I mean, yeah. it's the first movie I saw in a movie theater when I was a kid. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I think we all have that background m movie where like when we can't figure out what we want to watch and we're kind of... I just want, sort of throw it on yeah. and put it in the background. You yeah. want to know what my movie is? What is your background movie? Dumb and Dumber. Oh, God. Come on, dude. I... I just love just, that movie. You just put it on and yeah. just sort of let, let it play? Yeah I, yeah. I know that movie well, and I, I could just go off and do what I need to do and just let it play in the background. I don't have to pay attention to it. It's just background noise. Well, That and the Star Wars movies. But I pay attention to the Star Wars movies, especially well, okay, the so, iconic parts. So back to life. Life, the movie. Can we talk um, about Dumb and Dumber more? Because we I, should. I'm I'm over. You life. brought it up earlier in the podcast, <laughs> but okay. So back to back to life. I I felt like here's the worst part about it. I didn't hate it. Yep. I actually thought some of the special effects were interesting. There's um because I love everything about real space travel. Mm -hmm. They kind of mimic. There's great YouTube videos of one of the astronauts on the International Space Station that does these videos where he answers questions brought to him by children. Yeah, I and thought lot, that was cool. A lot of the questions are like, how do you brush your teeth in space and things like that. So they kind of mimic that a little bit at the beginning. And there's a, one very long shot. The movie opens with one shot that is just continuous and just keeps going right yeah so um and then it turned into for a part of the time it turned into a sort of a low rent gravity yep it was a little bit like gravity which i thought didn't make a lot of sense but uh i, I like all that real outer space stuff but we just didn't get that i felt like I, I felt like the movie was struggling for a theme it was really just a monster movie yeah, and not a good one either, because I thought the creature design was terrible. I thought if you were going to go with a creature that kind of evolved over time, why don't you do something amazing with it? Like, ha the it seemed like the creature only had, like, three different phases. It just... It needed more. Um, I also wished they would have done the alien thing, and I know I've criticized it for being an alien ripoff, but the thing about alien is you didn't know where it was. You didn't know where it was going to come from, and it seemed like in this movie you always knew where the monster was, or Calvin was it? Yeah, yeah. They, they, it they named it. Yeah. They named it Calvin you, in, in sort of a really weird way, which is a t I thought it was terrible. That's a terrible idea. Yeah, you always knew where it was, so it kind of took away the suspense. Right. Um, it just, I, it's one of those movies where tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'm just going to forget all about it. It's not going to leave an, a lasting impact. And, and I hate to agree with you. It fits into that category of movies where I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. Yeah, so it's sort it's, of right in the middle. It's forgettable. So it's uh, kind of, yeah, exactly. It's sort of milk toast in the middle, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is the worst. I yeah. feel like if we hated it, if the two of us hated it, that would have been kind of fun yeah. to talk about. But I didn't completely hate it. It just wasn't remarkable. It was, it was, you know what it was? It was unremarkable. Yep. Life was unremarkable. It, it just needed, it needed a character that we could really root for and get behind. What's yeah. weird is, I don't want to give it away. Well, should I? No, I, I think we should keep it spoiler free. All right, let's, Let, let's we're going to keep this spoiler free. The most likable character uh, meets There's its end pretty quickly. Yeah, that I, I was exactly what I was going to say, and you just gave it away. That's that's not really a spoiler. Right, well, okay. We, we didn't dive we're not, we're not, yeah, we're not, we're not. Yeah, we're not. Yeah, there's a character that's like, oh, that's that's a likable character. I will root for that character killed off. Yeah. Killed Everybody off. knows people are going to die in this movie. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So That's um, not a spoiler. Yeah, you, you introduce some people you're supposed to like, and they're off to one by one. Yep. That is, that is the formula for outer space alien movies. Yeah, one thing I did like about it, though, I liked that it kind of took place in 
the present, but a slightly more advanced version of the present. Yeah, not, yeah, it, not, yeah. not far in the future. I mean, like mm-hmm. maybe a couple years, but it's not like 10 years in the future. Yeah, you know, it wasn't like, like maybe oh, like we just have artificial a few gravity. We can walk around and stuff like that. It was there. No, it was around. there in their yeah. International Space Station, which is a real thing that exists. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and the payload that they receive is the thing that has this alien life form. But I like that because it, it it creates a challenge for the filmmakers. Yeah, you have to mimic kind of real life and and. and, science. and, and and let's leave it at that. Okay, sure. so, all right. Uh, look, you can find me at that Chris Gore. I'm that Chris Gore on everything. You can find Film Thread on Instagram and Facebook. And visit, fil- visit filmthread.com for uh, updated coverage every day, new independent films, interviews, and upcoming to this podcast, we're going to start having interviews with more filmmakers. And, uh, Anthony, where can we find you? This Game Cheats on Twitter. Why is it that every podcast ends with that kind of thing? Where it's like, and here's my credentials, and follow me at, and blah, blah, blah. I hate, I sort of am tired of it. I, it's I don't boring know. to me. I follow your lead. All right. Okay, cool. Well, we're going to do it differently. All right. And and uh, this is where we say, let's, let's get, get out of here. here.